Welcome back to Newsmax Now. I'm Miranda Kahn. Topping your headlines right now, the Charlie Hebdo magazine releases its latest issue with a very defiant cover reading. They got the weapons. Screw them. We got the champagne in French. It features a man drinking champagne as it pours out of holes in his body. The Charlie Hebdo magazine staff was attacked in January by gunmen who were angry over the magazine's portrayal of the Prophet Muhammad. President Obama compares himself to Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers in a new article published by GQ today. The president says both he and Rodgers don't get flustered by what's going on around them. Marco Rubio says he won't renominate Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen if he becomes president. Rubio says the U.S. has become, quote, Fed obsessed. He says the Fed is not a substitute for other policies which could lead to more economic growth. And the Justice Department says the Obama administration is banned from bringing Guantanamo Bay prisoners to the U.S. The current state of the law is that individuals are not transferred from Guantanamo to U.S. US shores. But the Obama administration is still looking for prisons to relocate dozens of Gitmo detainees. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan says he's finally in remission after months of chemotherapy, but Hogan says there's still a chance his cancer could come back, so he plans to continue preventative health care. Thanks for joining me, John. It's good to be with good, you. Yeah, uh, we were actually planning to play some sound there, but hopefully we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's go ahead and take a listen. Donald Trump talking okay. about the uh, refugees coming to the United States. At least one and probably more of the killers, the animals that did what they did in Paris, came out of the migration. I have a bigger heart. I mean, I have a tremendous heart. I want to take care of people. But you look at this migration, and I said to my wife the other day, I said, you know, they're all, they seem like so many men. And they're so strong. Is this a Trojan horse? We all know the story of the Trojan horse. Okay, that was kind of a quick little compilation of Donald Trump speaking last night in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now, if you could, let's just flash back a little bit to September. This is what Trump said on Fox's O'Reilly Factor. Now, do you object to migrants who are getting out of the Middle East and North Africa? Do you object to them coming to the USA? I hate the concept of it, but on a humanitarian basis, with what's happening, you have to. So a little bit of a progression there. Let's uh, talk to our roundtable and see if they can weigh in on this. And joining us, we have former Deputy Staff Secretary to President Bill Clinton, Attorney David Goodfriend, also with us, radio host and author Larry Elder. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Quite a progression there, I would well, say. Well, I think what, we see, what we've seen is how <clears throat> this, maybe, at least in the short term, is going to impact the presidential race on both sides of the I aisle. Mean, you saw Donald Trump back in September saying he doesn't like the idea, but from a humanitarian standpoint, you have to take in the refugees. Uh, Larry, he's not saying that today. Neither is anybody else on the Republican side. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton, if we can put up that tweet, says that these uh, a religious tests for refugees represents a new low. She says we've seen a lot of hateful rhetoric from the GOP. Um, again, this is a new low. How is that helping the conversation, though, Larry? Well, a lot of people have evolved on this issue. There's at least one Democratic governor among the 25, 26 that say they don't want to accept these refugees. And regarding this religious test business, the president of Egypt, uh, El Sisi, recently said in January of this year that there should be a religious revolution within the Islamic religion. Now, if you have people like that questioning whether or not uh, Islam ought to have a religious rev a re revolution, I think it's legitimate to ask whether or not we want to bring in a bunch of people, some of whom may very well uh, become radicalized. I see no reason why we can't have a pause, uh, as many people are suggesting, to make sure that the vetting procedure is thorough. So you're not saying we shouldn't let Muslims in. You're just saying we need to have a better vetting process. That's right. Uh, we're, we're not Europe. People are not showing up on our shores like that. Uh, and then they have to sort out the terrorists from the non-terrorists. We vet them where they are before we bring them here. So our procedure is a lot longer. It takes about a year. It's much more thorough. And the likelihood is low, but the likelihood is not zero. David, do you think this is still going to be an issue that the presidential candidates are going to be really focused on, say, three months from now? I think it's going to be an issue that persists throughout the campaign, yes. But I think that it's drawing some interesting contrasts, not just between Democrats and Republicans, but between different leaders. Um, I think that Larry is right. There is a very thorough uh, asylum-seeking vetting process that involves the FBI, it involves Homeland Security, 
It involves State Department. It is quite thorough, and I think that those procedures are in place, and if anything, uh, will be strengthened. I do go back, however, to the comments of the Pope before the Paris tragedy. The Pope said, it is the moral responsibility of the West to help uh, migrants in this case, to try to help absorb uh, migrants. And it was after that, you recall, that many people in the United States started calling for increasing the number from 10,000 to some higher number of Syrian refugees who would be admitted with those screening procedures in place. So I, I don't think it's going to be an issue that goes away. It's going to be something that persists throughout the presidential campaign, but it is defining in the sense that it really will determine what kind of leader a presidential candidate wants to be. And I think that's that's healthy, actually. I mean, is this somebody who resorts to sort of the lowest common denominator or someone who calls us to our higher angels? That will be a determinant in this campaign, I believe. Larry, how much faith, though, can we have in our vetting process when we already have what is it, 11, 12 million undocumented workers already in the United States. So it, I can see how someone can say, I don't have a lot of faith there. Well, that's right. Well, that is the question. I mean, the very morning of the attacks, Obama said that ISIS had been contained. <clears throat> Obama called ISIS a JV team. Uh, this is about national security. And one of my questions is, why can't some of the countries in the Middle East take some of these refugees, especially Saudi Arabia, very wealthy, a lot of land, a lot of territory? Why is it on us, why is it on Europe to take in all these uh, refugees from the Middle East and from North Africa, as opposed to other parts of the of the Arab world? Well, Larry, you mentioned the uh, Egyptian president, al-Sisi, talking about a revolution within the Islamic faith. When you talk about Saudi Arabia, a lot of these refugees are Shia Muslims, not Sunni Muslims, and relocating them to a Sunni-dominated country uh, might only inflame that sectarian violence between these two sects of, of it's a very complicated issue to say the least. Uh, we got about a minute left for David. I wanted to ask you uh, about this too, because uh, you talk about the presidential candidates, you mentioned how it defines the the Republican field. Even maybe the most moderate guy out of the bunch, John Kasich, mm -hmm. is even calling for uh, a pause at least to the refugee stuff. I mean, you know, does it remind you at all of kind of the knee-jerk reactions we saw after 9-11? Well, absolutely. I mean, we think about our civil liberties, we think about our values as Americans. The toughest time to uphold those things is when we're under stress, when there's fear. That's when it's hardest. It's always easy during times of peace and prosperity to say, oh yeah, I believe in civil liberties and I believe in humanitarian things, but it's tougher when you're in a time of stress. I will say this, however, the linchpin to all of this, the, the root cause of all of this is the civil war in Syria. Yeah, let's pause and, right there, uh, gentlemen, because we got to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back with more from Larry Elder and David Goodfriend right after this. We have to look at ISIS as the leading threat of an international terror network. It cannot be contained. It must be defeated. But they're brushing off the question of whether or not President Obama underestimated ISIS. Hillary Clinton there made that statement clearly contradicting the president's comments that ISIS had been contained. So what does this mean for Hillary in terms of being the president's close friend or on his good side? Let's bring back in our roundtable with us again, Larry Elder and David Goodfriend, former Deputy Staff Secretary to President Bill Clinton. Uh, guys, before we talk about Hillary, I want to go back to what we were talking about before because we had to go to commercial break. Um, one of the things that I look at, you, you know, I remember right after 9-11 and all of us trusting our guts for that uh, initial response, and then we, what we got was the Iraq War. Right. Uh, we've, we're basically still in that war today. And it, it, for me, it's difficult to watch Congress, especially Paul Ryan today, say that the president does not need a new authorization for the use of military force still relying on the one that Congress passed back in 2001. And some of the same people who were uh, renaming French fries Freedom Fries are the ones saying <laughs> now that we need to stand in solidarity with our French brothers. It just, I, I, it just seems like a lot of knee-jerk reaction, Larry, and I think Congress needs to help the president here and, and, and give him a new authorization for the use of military force. We need to redefine what the mission is going to be. What do you think? Well, I reject the idea that we kind of got into it uh, willy-nilly. We didn't. We had a joint resolution from the House, one from the Senate. Uh, he went to the United Nations, got a resolution 1441 that gave Saddam Hussein uh, a time to thoroughly declare I'm what he had. I'm not saying it was willy-nilly back then. What I'm saying is it's 2015 now. It's not 2001. We're not fighting Saddam Hussein well, right now. We're fighting ISIS uh, well, John, and, and its affiliates. And so we need I, to redefine what it is we're doing over there. 
Uh, absolutely, we need to redefine it. But as far as getting authority is concerned, I would argue we didn't need to have authority in 2001. The president, as commander in chief, has a great deal of latitude to commit troops. Uh, and even then, it was an exercise in getting people uh, on board, getting people to stand up and say what they supported, as opposed to getting him kind of legal authority to do what he needs to do. The president has vast authority, and President Obama could uh, commit troops tomorrow if he wanted to. David? Well, I hardly think that going back to the uh, invasion of Iraq as a an example of uh, what we ought to do is 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 really where we want to be heading as a country right now. I think instead uh, we have to understand that we're dealing with an enemy uh, that is far more complex than a nation state. This is not a nation state. This is a bunch of uh, criminals, thieves, and murderers who are uh, claiming territory and extending their reach beyond uh, uh, their base. So what do you do in a situation like that? I think it, a, a complex enemy demands a complex uh, uh, counterpunch. It's easy to talk in chest-thumping terms, let's go get them, let's go bomb them, let's do this. It's far more complicated than that. If you look at how ISIS has occupied a void in the Syrian civil war, first and foremost, I think, is addressing the Bashir Assad uh, regime and ending the civil war in partnership with countries around the world, in partnership, dare I say, with Russia and China and other sponsors of the Syrian leader. If that can occur, if you can put the civil war in Syria in reverse and establish stability there, you're constricting ISIS's ability to foment uh, discord, not only in the Middle East, but in Europe. So I think what we have going on in the United States right now is a multi-pronged, complex answer to a complex enemy. This much I will say, though, because I live in Washington, D.C. Remember when the Nazis were bombing London. Remember when there was terrorism going on in Israel. If you let the terrorists scare you, they win. Right. But, we but have Larry, to remember let me ask you this. Do you have faith in the president's yeah. strategy? I no, do. I don't. And Let me tell you something. Robert Gates, Hold his on. former Secretary of Defense, wrote a devastating critique of Obama and said that Obama did not trust his military and that Joe Biden would lean into his ear and whisper that they're trying to jam you, trying to bully you. Their verbs, not mine. That's one of the reasons there's no strategy. Obama, apart from not believing, in my opinion, that this is an existential threat to Western civilization, does not trust the military. He thinks they're trying to... All right, let's let David uh, finish, because he got interrupted he there a second ago. Go ahead, David. David, go ahead. That there is a strategy. It does involve the Syrian civil war, diplomacy there, military on the ground, bombing the 150 oil tankers we just saw. It's complex. It's not the kind of thing you get to say in a soundbite, unfortunately, but I do have faith in it. And all you have to see is the 25 percent reduction in territory controlled by ISIS today compared to when they were at their height and the campaign began. It's going to take longer than we think, but we can't run around scared. If they scare us, they win. If we say keep calm and carry on, I am going to keep riding the metro in Washington, D.C. I am going about my life. They will not scare me. They will not win. That's how we as Americans win this fight. All right, Larry, Larry Elder and David Goodfriend, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the answer might not always be easy. Yes. We might not like how it feels. But we're going to talk about another Republican who's actually supporting the president's strategy coming up in the next block. Also, we still have time for you to weigh in. What do you think about the president's plan to resettle Syrian migrants here in the United States? Tweet us at Newsmax now. Leave a comment on our Facebook page. We'll have some of those comments coming up here in just a few moments.